The epistle of James is one of those books that is two saints in the time of Jacob's trouble or what people mostly know as the tribulation. That does not mean we can't get instruction in righteousness for the church age and apply things in this epistle to us in a practical sense. But in a doctrinal sense, it is primarily to a completely different time than we are living in now. The James who wrote the letter would be James of Zebedee, who was killed in Acts chapter 12. So this epistle had to be written before Acts 12. You will see a theme in the book of James about rich people being damned. And we will get more into that later. And guys like Martin Luther didn't like the book of James because he didn't understand it. He failed to rightly divide the word of truth. But there is no problem with this book. You just let the verses say what they want to say and apply them doctrinally to the right people. When you do this, you will see there are no errors or contradictions in the Bible. Don't change the words and don't just spiritualize the verses so they fit your belief. You don't adjust the Bible to fit your belief. You adjust your belief to fit the Bible. It don't matter if you've always believed something your whole life. If you find out that the Bible is saying something different, then change your belief to fit the Bible. And that's what makes you a Bible believer. You don't have to go after man's tradition and the things a man has always taught you. If those things are wrong and they contradict the Bible, you should always choose the Bible first. But this book has five chapters and 108 verses. We're just going to start in James chapter 1 and verse 1. It says, James, a servant of God, and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. Here we find out who the book is addressed to. When studying the Bible, you need to ask who's talking, to whom is he talking, and what is he talking about. So we can see he, he is talking to Jews, because it says to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. You can see who the twelve tribes are in Revelation 7, verses 1 through 10. They are Jews. We know this letter isn't addressed doctrinally to the body of Christ because spiritually speaking, there is neither Jew nor Greek in Christ. And notice I said spiritually speaking. I'm not one of these guys going around saying a Jew isn't still physically a Jew after being born again. But Joel 3.2 gives us more insight about who these scattered abroad are. And it says, I will also gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. More proof that this is doctrinally for Jews in the last days is because it says last days in the book of James several times like in James 5.3, and the word religion or religious occurs three times. It also quotes the Mosaic Law, and you find similarities between the book of James and the Sermon on the Mount. And if you're a dispensationalist, you know that the Sermon on the Mount shouldn't be applied to people in the church age. So keeping in mind who the book is addressed to doctrinally, we're going to go through it verse by verse and see how it is doctrinally towards Jews in the time of Jacob's trouble, but also we will get spiritual instruction for the church age as well. We're going to first look at some survival tips for the tribulation. And no born again believer is going through the tribulation. We are raptured out before this time period comes. But it's still interesting and fun to just go through the entire Bible and look at Things that's going to be in the tribulation, even though you're not going to be there. And maybe it'll give you a burden to go out and win people to Jesus Christ so they won't have to go through this horrible time. But tribulation, survival tip number one, is to endure temptation. James 1-2 says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Here James tells the Jews to be joyous when they are tempted. There are going to be temptations in the time of Jacob's trouble that we don't have in this day we are living in. 
Revelation 13, 17 says, And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. In the time of Jacob's trouble, notice I didn't say the church's trouble, because the church has already been raptured out at this point. But in the this time period, the time of Jacob's trouble, or what you know as the tribulation, people will be tempted to take the mark of the beast to provide for their family. 1 Timothy 5.8 says, But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith, and is worse than an infidel. And the time of Jacob's trouble, if you are one of God's people, then you are going to be poor, because you won't be able to buy or sell without the mark. So how tempting will it be to give in and take the mark when you have a starving wife and children to take care of? Imagine yourself being in that situation. And on top of that, you have to be joyous when you fall into this temptation. We are already seeing today how people are preparing for a mark of the beast system. But James 1.3 says, Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. Remember this word, patience. And if you look at Luke 21, you will see that the disciples are asking Jesus about the end times. And Luke 21, 7, it says, And they asked him, saying, Master, but when shall these things be? And what sign will there be when these things shall come to pass? And then he goes on to give them signs. And so let's read about those real quick. In Luke 21, 8 through 19, it says, And he said, Take heed that you be not deceived. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and the time draweth near. Go ye not therefore after them, but when ye shall hear of wars and commotions, be not terrified, for these things must first come to pass, but the end is not by and by. Then said he unto them, Nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and great earthquakes shall be in divers places, and famines, and pestilences, and fearful sights. And great signs shall there be from heaven. But before all these, they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and into prisons, bring, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. And it shall turn to you for a testimony. Settle it therefore in your hearts not to meditate before what ye shall answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist. And ye shall be betrayed both by parents and brethren and kinsfolk and friends. And some of you shall they cause to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But there shall not an hair of your head perish in your patience. Possess ye your souls. Notice that last verse. In your patience possess ye your souls. Notice, like I said, that word patience from James 1, 3, and then again here in Luke 21, 19. And this patience could refer to them enduring to the end of this time period, the time of Jacob's trouble. In Matthew 24, Jesus is telling the disciples about the very same thing. And in Matthew 24, 13, he says, But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. So this patience could refer to them enduring enduring unto the end they will either have to endure to the end or die as a martyr for jesus christ the joy of james 1 2 would be the joy they get from realizing they are enduring to the end because of what they are going to get after they are going to get to be with the lord jesus christ later on they will be joyous when dying as a martyr because they get a crown for doing so so James 1, three, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. And faith is definitely necessary for salvation in the time of Jacob's trouble. But the difference is unlike in the church age, it is by grace through faith without works in the church age. In the tribulation, it is faith plus works. They have to believe on Jesus Christ and keep the commandments. Revelation 14.12 says, here is the patience of the saints here are they that keep the commandments of god and the faith of jesus what did luke 21 19 say it said in your patience possess ye your souls so so they have to keep the commandments of god and the faith of jesus 
It's not just through faith, but through faith and patience. Look in Hebrews, which is another book directed doctrinally to Jews in the last days. In Hebrews 6.12 it says, That ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. And see, James and Hebrews are both directed toward, towards the Jews of the last days. And even the book of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, many of the stuff in the Gospels, you can't apply that to yourself doctrinally because you're a born-again believer in the church age. So all these people going around from like the Church of God or the Holiness churches or the Catholics who say a man can lose his salvation, they're just taking verses from these books that aren't even directed to us and they're applying it to us. And this is why they believe they can lose their salvation. So are they all just crazy or does the Bible really say someone can lose it? The truth is someone can lose their salvation. But it isn't us in the church age because we're not saved by works. Romans 4, 5 says, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, and not, not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So if you just uh, rightly divide the word of truth, apply the verses to who they're to be applied to, you're never going to come out teaching false doctrine. And then James 1, 4 says, But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. So count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, because the trying of your faith worketh patience. So if you have enough patience, it will work perfection. And perfection doesn't mean sinlessness in the Bible. But if you give into the flesh, it will not work perfection. Our flesh hates to have to wait for stuff. And especially in the time we are living in where technology makes everything instant. You have fast internet. You have microwaves. You have fast cars. Everything is fast in the time we are living in. And the Jews in the tribulation will be having to wait patiently for Jesus Christ to come back. Just like we are waiting patiently right now for the rapture. And our flesh has a hard time waiting on God. So in the time of Jacob's trouble there is going to be a whole new level of temptation. And they are going to have to be patient and endure to the end or die as a martyr. They can't take the mark and they are going to see their family suffer because they won't be able to provide for them. But moving on to tribulation survival tip number two. And that is to seek wisdom. If a man doesn't have wisdom, he won't know when to fear and when not to fear. He won't know what to do in a situation when every decision may cost him his life in this time period. James 1.5 says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that give it to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. Now go back and look at Proverbs chapter 2 verses 1 through 5. It says, My son, if thou wilt receive my words, and hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom, and apply thine heart to understanding, yea, if thou criest after knowledge, and liftest up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver, and searchest for her as for hid treasures, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord, and find the knowledge of God. Notice it said, If thou seekest her as silver, and searchest for her as for hid treasure. Even in the church age, we aren't supposed to set our affection on things down here, and worry about the treasures you get down here. But even more so for these tribulation saints who won't be able to have any material things by buying them because they can't buy or sell. And Proverbs 4, 5 says, Get wisdom, get understanding, forget it not, neither decline from the words of my mouth. Proverbs 4, 7, Wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom, and with all thy getting, get understanding. Proverbs 16, 16, how much better is it to get wisdom than gold and to get understanding rather to be chosen than silver? Getting wisdom 
is better than getting material things. Notice James 1.5 says God will give it liberally, and this means like bountifully and freely. A tribulation saint is going to need wisdom when he is trying to endure unto the end. And Psalms 111 and verse 10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. When he reads what God will do to a person who takes the mark of the beast, then he will fear the Lord, and the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. This is what happens to someone who takes the mark. Look at Revelation 14, 9 through 10. It shows you what happens to someone who takes the mark of the beast. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in, or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels, and in the presence of the Lamb. When God lets you go through diverse temptations and puts you through things, it makes you gain wisdom because you will draw nigh to Him. If you didn't go through those things, you would never have drawn close to Him or got in the book or prayed and asked for wisdom. If you lack wisdom, ask God for wisdom and understanding. Solomon asked for wisdom and understanding and God gave it to him. The Bible says about Solomon in 1 Kings 3.12, Behold, I have done according to thy words. I have, <clears throat> I have given thee a wise and understanding heart, so that there was none like thee before thee, neither after thee shall any arise like unto thee. People in the time of Jacob's trouble are going to need wisdom more than ever, and God will give it to them if they ask. They may not have a great deal of time to study, and the situation they will be in during this time period, but they will get wisdom just by asking God for it. And you have to remember also there will be a famine in the land. Amos chapter 8, 11 through 12 says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord, and they shall wander from sea to sea, and from the north even in, to the east, and they shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord and shall not find it. So there will be a famine in the land of hearing the words of the Lord. While now it is easy for us to hear the words of the Lord in this country we are in. We have all kinds of access to Bibles and preaching and all kinds of things pertaining to the word of God. But in the tribulation, there will be a worldwide hatred for God and His Word, and you won't find Bibles in doctor's offices or in stores or hotels. So these tribulation saints are going to have to ask for wisdom more than ever. In the church age we're living in, God gives us wisdom through His book. 1 Corinthians 2.13 says, but things also, Which things also we speak? Not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. If you want wisdom, stay in the book and ask God to give you wisdom and understanding towards the book. So God will give someone wisdom when they ask, and it says, He upbraideth not, which is like telling someone off and insulting them. He will also give it to them liberally, which is like bountifully and freely. So tribulation survival tip number three is have faith. And just like in the church age, faith also comes into play in the tribulation. James 1 6 says, But let him ask in faith nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. And Hebrews eleven six says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You ask in faith, knowing that God is almighty, and that God is able to answer your prayer. It doesn't mean you believe he will do it just because you are asking him to do it. You know that he will do it if that is in his will. And you know that he is able to do it. A reason many don't get their prayers answered is because they just flat out don't ask. James 4, 2 says, Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have and cannot, cannot obtain, ye fight in war, yet ye have not because ye ask not. 
James 1 6 also says nothing wavering. Waves are unpredictable. And James, who wrote this epistle, is a commercial fisherman, and he says, Waves are, are driven with the wind and tossed. And then Jude one thirteen says, Raging waves of the sea foaming out their own shame. A person who doesn't ask in faith and wavers will not get anything from God. That's why James one seven says, For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is not firm. He wavers like water. In Genesis 49, Reuben is said to be unstable as water. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways, as it says in verse 8. And then Psalms 12, 1 through 3 says, Help, Lord, for the godly man seizeth. For the faithful fail from among the children of men. They speak vanity, every one with his neighbor. With flattering lips and with a double heart do they speak. The Lord shall cut off all flattering lips and the tongue that speaketh proud things. In the time of Jacob's trouble, a double-minded man isn't nigh to God. James 4, eight says, Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. So that verse is saying a double-minded man isn't nigh to God. Whereas a born-again believer in the church age is always nigh to God. Ephesians 2.13 says, But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Doctrinally, a Christian is always nigh to God because of the blood of Jesus Christ. But we can apply verses like James 4.8 to us in a practical sense if we don't pray read our Bible, or try to stay in fellowship with God, then in a practical sense, we wouldn't be drawing nigh to God. But in a doctrinal sense, I'm in Jesus Christ, and He's in me, and I'm always nigh to God. A tribulation saint, however, might not always be nigh to God. They have to take a step towards Him and keep their self in fellowship to stay that way. Just like Revelation 14.12 said, and talks about the tribulation saint having to keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. I don't keep the faith. God keeps me, no matter what. A church-age saint can be double-minded and still be nigh to God, because he is made nigh by the blood of Christ. That's different than the tribulation saint. And Christians should, should definitely apply these verses for their self, for instruction in, right, in righteousness. We should stay close in fellowship with God through Bible reading and prayer so we don't turn out to be a double-minded man. But these have been some tribulation survival tips. And a Christian in the church age can get plenty of instruction and righteousness out of this lesson. A born-again believer should endure temptation. They should seek wisdom out of God's book and ask in faith while not asking for things to fulfill his own lust, and always saying to the Lord, if it is in your will. So this has been James chapter 1, and we're going to continue James chapter 1 in the next lesson.